Hey there, Andy Robertson here with CQE Academy, and in today's video, I'm gonna teach you all about the cost of quality. All right, let's head over. All right, let's get into today's lecture. So let's start with the agenda. We're gonna start with an intro to the cost of quality where I'm gonna show you the four cost of quality categories and their relationship back to cost of good and cost of bad quality, as well as the total cost of quality. And then we're gonna talk through each of the four cost of quality categories, prevention, appraisal, internal failures, and external failures. And in each of these four categories, we're going to talk about all of the activities that fall into these four buckets. And then we're going to wrap up with an explanation of Duran's quality cost curve. All right, let's get into it. So in 1956, a guy named Armand V. Feigenbaum wrote a paper in the Harvard Business Review where he introduced the world to this idea of the cost of quality. And in that article, he outlined four cost of quality categories that make up the total cost of quality. And those are prevention, appraisal, internal failures and external failures. And essentially every activity that we engage in as an operation or as a business unit can be categorized into one of these four buckets. And then he took this even further where he said prevention and appraisal fall into the cost of good quality and internal failures and external failures fall into the cost of poor quality. And then collectively these two categories make up the total cost of quality. He then went even kind of further into the article and he posed a question that you can ask yourself to help you categorize your cost or activity into one of these four buckets. And it could be summarized as essentially the right the first time perspective. So all you have to do is ask yourself is if we built a 100% conforming product, would that cost still be there? If you built non-conforming product and you incur some sort of cost, whether it be rework or customer complaints, that's cost of poor quality. If you built a 100% conforming product and that cost was still there, let's say it's testing or auditing, then that falls into the cost of good quality bucket. All right, now let's go through each of these four categories together. So when we talk about prevention, I always love starting with this quote from Benjamin Franklin where he said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Now he's using a medical reference, but when he said this back in 1736, he was actually talking about fire safety in the city of Philadelphia. In his opinion, it was better to spend time preventing fires than it was putting out fires after they had occurred. And he's exactly right, and that same approach should be taken to quality. Your time and your resources are much better spent preventing quality issues from ever occurring than it is dealing with them once they have occurred. So this idea of prevention is really important. When you're picking and choosing how you're going to spend your time and your resources, you should be focused on prevention costs. So what is a prevention cost? So prevention costs are those activities or costs that are specifically designed to prevent poor quality, or in another word, is a nonconformance. And throughout the entire quality system, whether we're talking about designing our product, managing our vendors, or managing our process, there are a number of different activities that we engage in that fall into this prevention bucket. So on the design side, we have a ton of activities that are intended to prevent poor quality. Market research and voice of the customer analysis, design inputs, robust design or design for Six Sigma, risk management tools like fault tree analysis or, or DFMEA, uh, design prototype testing, design outputs, design reviews, design VNV, process validation, equipment fixture, defect proofing, all of these activities are intended to prevent defects from ever occurring. And once we go into production, there's a lot of things we do from a vendor management perspective, right? Supplier quality and also process prevention to prevent nonconformances from ever occurring. So as it relates to our vendors, right? We evaluate vendors, we assess their capability, and then we ultimately qualify them to produce our product. And then over time, we've got tools like the supplier scorecard, supplier rating, supplier quality agreements, all of which, again, are intended to prevent nonconformances from occurring. Within our own production processes, we do a lot of things like new employee screening and new employee training, controlled storage of raw material, the quality planning process, quality system audits, writing procedures, doing predictive equipment maintenance, continuing education for our employees, quality system data, quality improvement projects. These are all activities within the operations that are intended to prevent poor quality or prevent nonconformances from ever occurring. And then there's always this discussion about the differences between prevention and appraisal. And I want to share this quote from W. Edwards Deming. He said, 
Quality comes not from inspection, but from improvement of the process. So when, when you're making a decision between whether to appraise something or test for something or prevent it from ever occurring, you should always focus on prevention. You should always focus on preventing nonconformances from ever occurring instead of just trying to inspect in quality. Now, that's a nice segue here to this next cost, which is appraisal cost. So appraisal cost is any activity or cost that is specifically designed to measure, inspect, evaluate, or audit our products to assure or ensure that they're conforming to requirements. All of these words here, measure, inspect, evaluate, are simply just synonyms of the word appraisal. So any activity that, that involves us appraising or testing the product is an appraisal cost. So on the supplier management side, this involves things like receiving inspection, source inspection, supplier audits, and supplier surveys. Essentially, we're checking and verifying that either the product is conforming or the vendor is following their quality management system. On the operations side, there's a ton of work we do. In-process testing. This could include measurements or functional testing, finished goods inspection, Equipment setup and testing, right? We're checking that our process parameters are, are in a validated state. Destructive testing. All of the costs associated with our measurement equipment could fall into the appraisal cost bucket. Laboratory testing. Any sort of testing and measurement and inspection that you do in your process to control your process falls into the appraisal bucket. And then from a quality management side, things like product audits, control charts and SPC, reviewing inspection data, the periodic review of documentation, maintenance and calibration of test equipment, any sort of process control and monitoring activities also fall into this bucket of appraisal. All right, so now let's get into the cost of poor quality. So the first bucket here is internal failure costs. And again, this is any cost or activity related to a non-conformance that is detected prior to the shipment to the customer. So the only difference between an internal failure and an external failure is when that failure is detected. If it's detected prior to shipment, it's internal. If it's detected after the shipment to the customer, it's external. So here are some examples of internal failure costs. Scrap and sorting, rework and reprocessing, reinspection, root cause investigation. So if you're investigating a problem that has occurred, there's an opportunity cost associated with that. If you weren't doing that activity, you could be off making improvements, reducing waste, improving process capability. There's other things you could be doing with your time as opposed to root cause investigation. Extra material handling, right? You have a nonconformance. You have to segregate that nonconforming material and put it in a hold area. There's costs associated with that. Extra capacity needs. If you know that your equipment routinely loses 10 to 15% yield loss, well, then you have to have extra capacity to make up for that yield loss. And all of that extra capacity costs money. It costs time. And all of those costs are related to poor quality. Lost labor, right? Let's say we have a nonconformance. We idle our equipment. All of the lost labor associated with that equipment downtime is internal failure costs. Excess inventory. This is one of those hidden costs of quality. So if we have a process that's not very capable and we've, we've got some yield loss or we've got a lot of downtime, a lot of times the, the reaction from the business is to hold extra inventory to mitigate the risk of even more downtime. And all of that excess inventory cost is simply just waste and it's related to an internal failure cost. Other things include scrap or rework due to design changes. If your design process isn't robust enough and you go into production and you're producing some nonconformance due to a design flaw, you have to make a design change and, and you might have to scrap material because of that design change. All of that is internal failure costs. And then the last one is employee turnover. Your employees get frustrated when they keep seeing the same repetitive issues come up and they don't get solved. And eventually that turns into employee turnover, which is absolutely an internal failure cost. And then external failure cost. This one's absolutely the most devastating. So external failure costs are any cost that's related to a nonconformance that was detected after shipment to the customer. This is absolutely the most expensive cost of quality category. These failures essentially occurred because prevention and appraisal activities didn't detect the nonconformance before shipment to the customer, which has now resulted in a ton of additional costs and customer dissatisfaction. These include things like warranty costs, repair costs, customer complaints, product liability and, and legal fees, the overhead cost of a field service team, recalls and market actions, lost sales and lost customers, and unfortunately, lost reputation and goodwill. 
if you're constantly shipping non-conforming products to your customers, eventually those customers are going to find somebody else to ship them conforming product. And that's a huge problem for your business. By the way, all of these failure costs can be viewed as a penalty for poor quality. And that penalty could be avoided through prevention and appraisal costs. All right, so let's finish off here with the Duran quality cost curve. So let me quickly describe what Duran did and how he did it. So on the y-axis, Duran puts cost. Okay, this is the cost of our activity. And on the x-axis here, he has quality ranging from 0% conforming product all the way up to 100% conforming product. And the first thing he, he shows us is the cost of good quality. So essentially what he says is that prevention and appraisal cost grow linearly as quality improves. Okay, that was Duran's estimate of prevention and appraisal costs. And you can see here at 100% conforming product, our prevention and appraisal costs are at their most expensive. Makes sense. And then he talks about internal and external failure costs, essentially the cost of poor quality. And what he shows us here is that at 100% conforming product, the cost of poor quality is essentially zero, and it grows exponentially as quality decreases. Because what ends up happening is as we ship more and more non-conforming material, that ends up getting to the customer, and they end up taking their business somewhere else. And then Duran wraps up this whole thing with what he calls the total cost of quality. And you can see that here in blue. And to create this curve, what we do is we combine the cost of good quality and the cost of poor quality into a total cost of quality curve. And the conclusion here, if you're looking at this curve is, the lowest cost of quality happens at 100% conformance. If we can get to this point where we have zero defects, the total cost of our product is minimized, right? Our cost is cheapest when our quality is highest. That was the point Duran was trying to make. All right, that's it for today. If you liked this, hit that like button so other people just like you can find the same content. And if you want to grow and become a quality engineer, hit that subscribe button. Every Wednesday, I'll be publishing a new video. And when you subscribe, you get immediate access and notification of those new videos so that I can help you grow and become a quality engineer. All right, thanks so much. Bye.